Judges chapter 2, we'll read verses 10 through 12. When you find your place, if you're able to, stand as we read the Word of God here, Judges chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. The Bible says, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And notice this part right here, church. This is a very convicting thought. And there rose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods and the gods of the people that were round about them and bound themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. I want to preach a simple thought, of actually a series of messages beginning tonight on there's some things worth fighting for. There's some things worth fighting for. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you again for allowing us to be here. Uh, Father, thank you for the songs that's been sung, the special that we've heard, the praises, the testimonies that we've heard tonight. Lord, they've blessed us and encouraged us. Thankful for the time of prayer. Father, and Lord, now we pray that you'd help us to focus on your word. Uh, Lord, for the message of the hour again, Lord, I pray that you'd remove us out of the way and have your will and your way be done in the service. And Lord, these things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I mentioned briefly this morning that our family had taken a trip up to Payson yesterday and uh, just really just kind of a little more celebration of our birthday, just take some time, a little short trip away. And uh, boy, I was really blessed by it, really. Honestly, it was a great relaxing trip, seen a few sights, climbed some rocks, had a good lunch, and just really, really enjoyed our time. Lord bless us with a beautiful day, uh, good weather and everything, so we just really had a good time. However, when we first got there, there was one thing that happened. I really gave it some thought later on. We had drove, of course, from our house and didn't stop. Uh, and if you travel with me, I don't like to stop. Amen. I stop as little as possible. Uh, you know, and when we do stop, we try to make the most of it. I want to get to our destination. Amen. And so we hadn't stopped there until we got there. So we got into town and we stopped at a local grocery store there because we needed to get a few things for our trail. And, uh, get some bottles of water and a couple things of that nature. So we stopped at a grocery store. Well, you know, every grocery store has their restrooms in a different location, right? And uh, this store, I thought, well, usually they have it on this side of the building. Well, it wasn't on that side of the building. It was on the total opposite side of the building. When I walked in, if I had taken a left, uh, that would have been the right way. But instead, I went the right way, and that was actually the wrong way. And so, you know, sometimes you get yourself all turned around. But nevertheless, what happened was when we had went that way and I discovered that the restrooms weren't on that side. I did a hard U-turn, hit the brakes, and turned completely around. Well, understand that during this time my children are following me. Okay? Well, apparently so, and I, and I didn't hear this and know this until after we had gotten in the van and we're on our way out. Uh, there was a, <laughs> a very nice old man who made a comment about my kids stopping in front of him. Uh, when I say nice old man, I'm being sarcastic. He wasn't happy that my kids had done a U-turn in front of him and turned around and went the other way. I didn't hear the comment, and it was probably good that I did not hear the comment because I would have wanted to make my own comment probably, right? Uh, I want to say something, church. I, I'm, I'm pretty protective of my children, right? And, and, and they did something in their innocency. All they were doing was following their daddy. That's all they were doing. They were following my footsteps. Literally where I was going, they were following me. But I got to thinking about that church and really where we're at here. Understand that we're in a day and an age where it is so critical that we need to watch our footsteps. Amen? You see, our children follow in our footsteps. Let's make sure that they're going in the right direction. Amen? Uh, one day our kids are going to grow up and their understanding and perception of the Lord is going to have a lot to do with what we did as parents or even grandparents. Now, I know what often happens when you bring a message like this is we think, well, I'm not rearing children. I don't have children in the home. I've never had children, so this message is not for me. No, friend, it is for you, each and every one that's here, because if you're a part of this church, we have children here. We have children that we're trying to rear up in this church, and you're here to set a godly example for it, I can take you to Scripture that shows us that we have a responsibility to train and help equip our children for the work of God. 
So this message is for everybody, no matter what stage that you are uh, in life. If you're a child here today, understand that we are also not perfect. Amen? We're not perfect, and I realize that. And we have, obviously, a scripture that says to obey them that have the rule over you. But what we're looking at today, we're really focusing on these scriptures this evening, church, where we just read here in Genesis, or excuse me, Judges, and it's really heartbreaking. Isn't it saddening to think that there arose a generation which knew not the Lord? Amen. And do you know why they did not know the Lord? And I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. We often see that one child that's in the grocery store throwing a fit, and we think shame on that child, or we could say shame on the parent for not properly instructing that child how to act and behave in the grocery store. I mean, if that child knew that there would be consequences for that, he would probably zip it up pretty quick, would he not? And the reality is that child doesn't believe that there's consequences, so children will learn to get away with anything that they possibly can, right? They'll, they'll, do, they'll push it as far as they can, and they know how much they can get away with. What we're looking at here in the Scripture, the first thing I want to mention there is we read in verse 10, they're also, excuse me, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. Let me say, first of all, that until the Lord returns, there's going to always be another generation. So th this responsibility is a generation responsibility. There's always going to be another generation that we need to train and equip for, to prepare for the work of God or serving the Lord. Now, you've heard it said before that what this generation does in moderation, the next generation does in excess. Let me give you an example, church. If we don't make church a priority in our lives, then don't expect your children to make church a priority in their lives. If we think, well, you know, we'll just show up when, whenever, right, and uh, just when we feel like coming, then don't be surprised when your children don't show up at all, except for maybe on Christmas and Easter. Uh, that's just the fact of it, right? What this generation does in moderation, the next generation does in excess. They will take that further. And we're, we see that even more and more today. I mean, what we're living in a day, church, where we have transferred from even calling things that we used to call sin, now we call them a sickness. Amen. Can I say that again? With things that we used to call sin, now we call them a sickness, right? Uh, things that, we, that, that the, we used to call in the Bible, in the Word of God, disobedience, now we classify it as some kind of condition that children need to be treated for. Right. Hey, I had a medicine too. It was called the Board of Seat of Education. Amen? And, and that was the medicine that, that I got, and, and it helped cure a lot of things. And eventually, it took me a while because I had a pretty hard head. But it took me a while to eventually, you know what? If I do what my parents tell me to do, I don't get that lesson from the Board of Education. Right? I mean, honestly, I was probably a teenager and I finally started to figure some of that out. Just do what you're told and you, and you don't have to worry about that. And I know that a lot of times we chuckle when we hear things like that, but the reality is that's what's happening today. You take your kids to a doctor and they say, well, they got this condition or that condition, right? No, they have a sin condition. Church, I said they have a sin, sinful condition, right? Hey, nobody taught your kids how to misbehave. They learned that all on their own. Now, you may have not helped it. You may have helped them to a uh, few things as said. In fact, I, we've even heard kids say things. I'm talking about young children use words that come out of their mouth that you would not think a small child would know those words. Well, guess where they heard those words? At home. From mommy and daddy. And, and you know what the, what the embarrassment is and the shame is? That child doesn't even know what that word means. But it's something that he heard. I remember, you know, one of the biggest blessings, uh, I guess it depends on how you look at it, but I, I love talking to little kids. I mean, I just like talking to so young children. Uh, they're, they're always fun. I like to joke around with them, steal their candy if I possibly can't. No, I'm just joking. But I, I love talking with little children, love babies, amen? And I remember one time I was filling in, uh, this was back when I was principal of Micah Christian School in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was filling in on a class waiting for the kindergarten, or it might have been first grade, teacher to get there. She was running a little bit late, and one of those things you can't call in a sub at the last minute. So I, I was calling, I was filling in, and we were having a time of prayer. And sometimes the prayer requests that you hear from small children are very fascinating, amen? You know, pray for me that I could eat my vegetables today, amen? 
you know, pray, y'all pray for me. I need to eat some more vegetables. Amen. I agree with you there, bud. Uh, pray for my, my dog because he got sick the other day and it made my mom really mad. You know, things like that. But there was one young boy, he said, please pray for my daddy. He broke his arm. I said, oh, honey, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. I hope that he's okay. He said, well, my mom said if he hadn't been drunk at the moment and fell off the porch, he wouldn't have broke his arm. I thought, glory to God, son. <laughs> I said, what'd you do? We prayed for his daddy. I mean, the boy asked for prayer for his daddy. Kids, kids are watching, mom and dad. Grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles, fellow church. Kids are watching you. Do you realize that children will get to the place and decide that they're going to do or not do a certain thing based on what they've seen you do? Right? You know, that's, for example, that's one of the things that we call, oh, well, you know, drinking, you know, pastor, that's a thing that, uh, you know, we only do at holidays. It's a social thing, but yet the Bible still calls it sin. That's not very popular to say much these days, Brother Eccles, but it's, it's scriptural. Hey, I've done an extensive study, in case you're wondering, on alcohol. The only time that I see it condoned in the scripture was for sickness or, or, or near-death experiences. That's the only time that we see that. But today we call it everything else except for what it is. That's just an example. You see, friend, there is a problem that we're having today. We're raising, you, you know what's heartbreaking, church, is that we have parents that are more proud of their children for getting a high school education than we are from parents that when their kid surrenders their life to the Lord, and we're more proud in the moment of them receiving a college degree than we are them surrendering their life to God. Something's wrong. Come on. Preaching. Something's Preaching. wrong. Now, I never said don't be proud of you. I did not say don't be proud of your child for, for graduating and getting an education. That's not what I said. I'm saying that we, we have more pride in that than we do in excitement about a, a young child giving their heart over to Jesus. Amen? Hey, friends, something's wrong with our generation. But the first thing I want to mention, there's, this is going to be constant. Until the Lord wants to come back and take us home, there's always going to be another generation that, that we need to be concerned about. As we read along here, the problem that we see, of course, is that we've gotten to the place where things we used to call sin are now called sicknesses. But the next thing I want to mention here is that there's no personal relationship with the Lord. Did you notice there? It says, there rose up another generation after them which knew not the Lord. For somebody who does not know the Lord, that means they don't have a personal relationship with God. Say, so is that a problem? Well, if you're concerned about them going to heaven or hell, it's a problem. I think it's a pretty major problem. And friend, it's a sad day that we have children raising up in our home and we have failed to teach them the very basics of the gospel and the very basics of them coming to know Christ as their personal Savior because here there was a generation which didn't know God. Friend, I fear my children growing up and not knowing the Lord. I fear a genera of my kids growing up and not desiring to serve God. Now listen, whatever God calls them to do, if God calls them to be a mechanic, friend, listen, we need some Christian mechanics out there. Wouldn't you agree, friend? We need some honest, God-fearing Christian mechanics out there that can do honest work for an honest day labor. There, there's nothing wrong with that. One of the things that I think going on in our country is that we're guilty of worship and education. Somebody has a, a degree next to their name, and, and that's the only sense of a con. But listen, we need plumbers today. We need electricians. There's all kinds of wonderful trades out there that they can learn and make an honest living. But I fear my children not being in the will of God more than I fear what kind of career they're going to have. I fear my children not serving God more than I'm as concerned about who, who they're going to marry. Now, that's, of course, important for another lesson for another day. But my biggest concern is that they know the Lord in a personal way. Right. Friend, if, I, if my children grow up not knowing the Lord, I want to tell you that I will be a miserable failure. So what we're seeing here is that there rose up a generation which knew not the Lord. So we see that there's always another generation. We see that there's no personal relationship with the Lord. Let me remind you, the Bible says in he, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You see, friend, there's a nurturing process that we as men are supposed to take towards our children. You, you know what I'm afraid of today is too many times, go ask your mom. 
right? And I realize there's times where probably she does know. That she's, she's smart. Most of the time they're smarter than us men, and I get that. But sometimes when our kids come to us about things, they're coming to Daddy for some, from, for some advice. Amen? And we ought to be willing to sit down with our children and give them good godly counsel and give them a reason why we believe. I, I love it when my children come and ask me something. I love to be able to spend some time and show them and see them come to an understanding of why we believe what we believe, why we practice what we practice. Hey, friend, guess what? One day they're not always going to live under my roof. One of them in particular says they're going to, but, you know, that's what they say now. <laughs> but they're not always going to live under our roof. And guess what? One day they're going to have to make a decision on themselves. And you know what I desire? Brother Dana read that scripture this morning. The Bible says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Daniel had made a decision as a young boy, as a young man, that he was not going to defile himself. I wish that every child that comes here, every young person that comes to Florence Baptist Church would go ahead and make that pur purpose in their heart that they're not going to defile themselves. Amen? But you know, part of that is us helping them and teaching them what they need to keep themselves defiled from. So you see, church, we have a responsibility as men to not provoke them to anger or to wrath, as the Bible says, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Proverbs 29.15 the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Friend, there's things that I believe that we ought to be teaching our children. Amen. If you just let a child raise themselves, you know, you know what was a blessing and also sad at the, at the same time, the last church that we were serving at, uh, before we came here, my wife and I were teaching the uh, junior class. And a lot of the children that came, you know, that was in the part of the junior class, also came the bus, rode in on the buses. Their parents didn't bring them to church. They came in on the church bus, right? I'm glad that they did, by the way, because this was probably the only time they had heard anybody cared about them and loved them in a long time. And I remember one young lady in particular, and she was always just into something, always getting into something. And somebody one day told me about her home life. They said, you know, she goes home, her mom don't care what she does. She does whatever she wants. In fact, she tells her mom what to do. Friend, a child left himself, the Bible says, bring it to his mother's shame. There's no discipline. There's no love in the home. And, and, and sadly, there's no teaching in the home about any kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The only thing that that girl was getting was riding on, in on the bus on Sunday morning and hearing the Sunday school lesson and hearing the preaching. And that, that, that was her opportunity to, for a change to happen in her life, for God to do something in her life. But you see, friend... Children left to themselves that, hey, they, they don't generally grow up with a desire, hey, I think I'm going to do good things, I'm going to do right. No, they need godly examples. They need godly leadership in the home, and God has called us all to do that. So we see that there's always another generation. Second of all, there's no personal relationship with the Lord. That's what it said right here. They knew not the Lord. The third thing I want to mention is there's no knowledge of the work of God. Did you notice there it also said not only did they not know the Lord, it says nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. One of the most important things that our children know is what God has done for you in your life. Friend, you know, it's probably a good thing to, to, to share our testimony with our kids. You know, they're, they're trying to take away a lot of things. I, I know that Brother Dana, he's, he's working constantly and tweaking our live stream, our, our audio equipment. It's a lot. It's a lot to keep up with. But I'll be honest with you, church, I'm not going to be surprised when a day comes when they, when they shut our live stream down for things that were preached from the pulpit here. So don't be surprised if the, if the live stream is not there one day because the account has been deleted, right? Because it was taken down, you know. But what I'm saying, friend, is that we're growing up in a generation today where there's, we, we have failed to teach God of his goodness. And the whole reason I was mentioning things that they're taking away because the one thing they cannot take away is your testimony. That's right. That's right. Nobody can tell you what God has or has not done in your life. I know what God has done in my life. Right. Hey, look, you know, the reality is you could take my copy of the Word of God. You, you, you could take my home. You could take place that I work. There's a lot of things that you could take away from, but you can't take away what God's done for me. You can't take away the fact that God saved my soul. 
Amen? And that's one thing that cannot be taken away from you, friend. Once you're saved, God saved you. Hey, you know your home in heaven is secure. You know where you're going to die when you, uh, or you know where you're going to go when you die. That cannot be taken away from you. Hey, friend, our children need to know that. Our children need to see the goodness of God. They need to hear what God has done in our lives. And oftentimes, most of what they hear is, my goodness, I have to go to work. And I get that, friend. I get there sometimes. I'll be honest. That sometimes it's tough to manage everything. I get that. But you know what? They also really more importantly to hear is that, hey, I get to, get a job. I get to go to work. God has blessed me with a job. Is it a demanding job? Yeah, it is, but it's a good job. God has blessed me with a way to provide for my family, and I'm thankful for that, friend. Hey, there, there's a lot that we have to be thankful for. I mentioned that one of the things that I'm not a big fan of personally, I don't really like going to the grocery store, right? You know? Now I feel like uh, either it's a long checkout line or I'm working for Walmart. I'm still waiting for my 1099. Then, you know, they're, you're welcome to do the self-checkout. That's all right. I don't work here, hey, man. I'm just kidding. I, I do it too. Just to, but what I'm saying is that, hey, it's, it's a challenge anymore. Hey, if you've ever been to Coolidge Walmart in the middle of the day, you better be prepared to stay for a while. Hey, man, you better be in there for the long run, right? It takes a minute. But you know, again, every single time, Brother Tuck, I start to want to complain about having to go to the grocery store, the Lord says, hey, you know what? You better be glad you have money to get groceries. Huh? Uh, God has blessed me. Hey, I, real, realistically, I could go in there and buy whatever I need to buy. There's some things that I would want to buy that I don't need to buy, but that's not what I'm talking about. Hey, I could go in there and buy whatever groceries I need to buy to put food on my children's table. Friend, that is a blessing. Our children need to see that it's a blessing for you to be able to go to the grocery store. Our children need to know that it's a blessing for us to have a job. Our children need to know that it's a blessing to have a church home to go to. Friends, I, I still know people today now, I, I've tried to encourage them, I've tried to help. You know, there, there's people still, you know, that message me all the time, I wish you were a pastor here, and all that's fine and good, but the reality is, excuse me, they need to get in church. They need to get in church. We, we have an abundance of churches here. Now, I never said that the church will find is everything what they, what they prefer, and sometimes we get hung up on things, don't we? We get hung up. Well, I don't like the way that he dresses, you know? I, I don't like the way that the song leader sings, you know, just, just whatever, you know? Uh, well, you, we, we come up all kinds of things. You'd be surprised some of the things. I told you about the fellow who didn't come to church because of peanut butter. Say, what, well, did he have a peanut allergy? No, he said he didn't come because of peanut butter. He thought that was just as good an excuse as the next one. So why make up an excuse? Honestly, I respect the man for what he said. He just didn't want to come to church. But you see, friend, we need to take it. You show appreciation for the house of God. Your attendance is his boat to keep the doors open for the record. Amen? Your, your, your faithfulness here to the house of God makes an impact... Your children, let me say it this way, I'm not wonder what we're doing on Sunday morning. Amen. They ought not wonder what we're doing Sunday night. They ought not wonder what we're doing Wednesday night. Now I realize things happen. That's not what I'm talking about. I realize sometimes your job forces you. I get that. That's not what I'm talking about. But friend, your children ought to know that when Sunday comes that it's time to go to church. We're not going to a football game. Amen. We're not going to go see the Arizona Cardinals play. We're not going to go uh, have, have brunch on the lake. Amen. We're going to the house of God. We're going to church. Hey, you know what? Even when we're on vacation, we find somewhere to go to church. You know why? Because I personally always had a belief that God's never taken a vacation from me, so I don't have a desire to take a vacation from Him. That's just a personal conviction of mine. Amen? So even when we travel, we go out to, we find somewhere to go to church. Why? Well, one, because I want to, and I want to worship the Lord, and even if I'm not the one preaching, I still need to go to church. Two, I want my children to know that, hey, look, church is important. Church is important. We're, we're going to be faithful to the house of God. We see here, church, that there was always another generation. We see here that the generation here were, were read in our text, that they had no personal relationship with the Lord. We see here that they grew up with no knowledge of the work of God. The fourth thing I want to mention is that this kind of life results in a wicked lifestyle and beliefs. If you look in verse number 11, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. 
I want to talk about that part where it says for a second, evil in the sight of the Lord. We, as parents and grandparents, seem to be satisfied with our children as long as they're not a criminal, as long as they've not, you know, done drugs, they don't rob banks, they don't do all these things, and that's enough, right? But yet there's good people out there that's not committed a crime, never even gotten a speeding ticket. But can I say something real quick? They're lost and on their way to hell. Good people. Good people die and go to hell every single day. What I'm saying is that God's definition of wickedness in His sight is much different than our definition of wickedness in our sight. Because the Bible says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Can, can we get past this place where we're just content only if they don't go to jail? Can, can we get back to this place that we're not content as far as our children? We're going to stay on our knees. We're going to do everything in our power and make sure that they live in the center of God's will. Because that's what we ought to desire as parents. We ought, we ought to desire for our children to serve God with their life. Let's not just be content. Well, you know, I'm proud of my kids. They, they don't go to church. I hear it all the time. Now, Pastor, they don't go to church. They're good people, but they're not. Hey, friend, th do we think that that's acceptable to the Lord? Honestly. Do we believe that God is pleased with that? He's not. When yet the Bible says to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as a man or some image, and even so much the more, the more as you see the day approaching. Friend, if your kids, hey, you ought to pray on your knees every day. You ought to get on your knees before God and say, God, do something in my children's life. Save their souls. Because the reality is, friend, if they die without Christ, if they die without Christ, the Bible says that they'll be cast into the lake of fire. The rich man opened his eyes, being in hell, being in torment. And friend, these are things, that, th this is part of the things that we need to know and acknowledge. As we grow as Christians, we need to know that, hey, it doesn't matter who they are, good people die and go to hell every single day. Now, sometimes we struggle with that, but it, it's biblical, and it's true. Listen, I hope that you are proud of your kids. All I'm saying is let not, not be enough. Don't rest until, hey, you ought to call your children up and say, hey, if you've recently been saved, you ought to call your children up and say, can I tell you what Jesus has done for me? Can I tell you what he's doing in my life? I want you to know that, hey, Jesus loves you and Jesus wants to save your soul too. And friend, we ought to not rest. That's the very least that we can do as parents, grandparents, whatever our situation is. Friend, our society as a whole, I'm not saying you personally, our society as a whole is failing to teach our generation, and there is a generation growing up today, just as it says, which knew not the Lord. So we see, we mention here, the, there's always another generation, there's no personal relationship with the Lord, there's no knowledge of the work of God, it results in wicked lifestyle. Let me remind you uh, about the sons of Eli. Now anybody, remember who know who Eli is? Remember who Eli, Eli was? He, he was Samuel's uh, instructor at first, or teacher if you want to call him that. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. They grew up in church and didn't know God. They knew not the Lord, right? And then it says in 1 Samuel 2.22, Now Eli was very old. Uh, let me go there real quick here. Hold on just a second. Go there. Go ahead and go there. First Samuel twenty-two. First Samuel chapter two, verse twenty-two. My notes kind of have it cut off here, so I want to turn there. I'd rather not cut it short. First Samuel chapter two and verse twenty-two. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. Watch this, how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 12, it says they knew not the Lord. Verse 22, it showed their wicked, sinful lifestyle. The, these, were, these were 
Preacher's sons. Huh? Teachers, preacher's sons. Huh? I, I think so. I'm not sure. We'll get to that later, Tuck. But they were, grew up in church. And yet, this was their lifestyle. Friend, we see it happening all the time. But what, what seems to be the problem with a generational gap between the ages of 18 and 30 or so? You know, they go to church up until the time they're 18. When they, when they turn 18, 19, they start to fall off. They got no motivation to be in the house of God. Moms and dads, where'd we go wrong? Where'd we go wrong? We failed to teach the importance of serving the Lord. We failed to teach them the importance of being faithful to the house of God. And oftentimes we want to say, well, you know, they're just straying away from the Lord. And I get that. People do do that. I acknowledge that. But friend, what have, what have we done? This is an urgent matter, church. This is something that we need to emphasize. This is something that we need to teach. What? Well, listen. We ought to not come to church just waiting for it to be over. We ought to come to church with a zeal and an excitement. We ought to come to church with, a, with enthusiasm to come to the house of God. And you know sometimes what happens is that we've already decided how the service is going to go before we even arrive. Sometimes it's based on who's preaching or teaching. Sometimes it's based on what we got going on that day. And friend, we come in here, don't, don't, all I'm saying, church, don't expect our kids to be excited about church if we're not. Don't expect them to have a zeal if we don't. So the last thing I want to mention is they live their own life without any regard for the Lord. That's what we're seeing here in verse number 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their father, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods and the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. They lived their life with no thought about the Lord, no, no desire for the Lord. Let me also remind you in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. In verse number 7, it says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, you think it's talking about your church house? It's talking about your house. Amen. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. God has put upon us an awesome responsibility, church. And you know, and some, I get it. I'm a parent too. Sometimes you get frustrated with your kids. I get that. But the reality is that God has given me four blessings. Yes, sir. Amen. Honestly, they don't actually, they're my children, but they belong to the Lord. Amen. Yes, they are my flesh and blood, but they belong to God. Right? right? Amen. They are God's vessels. They are God's creation. And God has allowed me to be in charge of them for the first few years of their life. And friend, after that story happened yesterday, and I was thinking about it, I never said anything else about it. But I got to thinking, my children were following in my footsteps. And in that moment, I was leading them in the wrong direction. And then I realized I was going in the wrong direction, so I turned around and went to the right direction. Right? Friend, maybe you've lived a life in such a way where you did not lead your children in the right direction for a while. But you know what you can do? You can turn around and start to lead your children. We always want to preach, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he shall not depart from it. But if you train up your child in that way, then you better go that way yourself. Amen. Don't expect your children to go that way if you're not interested in going that way. Because, friends, your children will follow in your footsteps. I remember another particular moment, another particular day, we were coming across a sort of busy street and you know of course you always want to watch your children as they're learning to cross roads you try to teach them look both ways but we were crossing a road actually I think it was even just in the parking lot you know but it's a busy parking lot and as I was walking along through one of my children for their sake of their embarrassment I'm not going to say their name right they always say daddy don't mention my name but they said daddy stop 
And I said, what's going on, baby? They said, you forgot to hold my hand. I thought, glory to God, son. I went back. I started to say her hand, but then you all figure out who it was. <laughs> I, went and grabbed, I went back and grabbed her hand. I said, Daddy's right here. You know, what that, you know that, that's what we need to be for our children. I realized in that moment it was a little situation because she's still learning, and, and I'm not ready for her to cross roads by herself, right? And this has been several years ago, by the way. But you know what will help us to guide our children? Apostle Paul made a statement. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And the reality is, friend, if our children are not following in the right direction by following us, it probably means that we're not following Christ as we should be. Because if, if we're following Christ, that means we're going in the right direction. If we're not following Christ, that means we're going in the wrong direction. So if our goal is to follow Christ and our children are going to follow us, you see how that works? It will help us tremendously if we follow, why don't we hold on to God's hand? Why don't, hey, why don't we be like Moses? Lord, I, I refuse to go without you. I ain't going. Lord, I'm not going. Why do I want to go without your help and your presence? To talk, referring to a refer, reference this morning, talked about the cave scenes. But Moses was not going to go without the power of God, without the presence of God in his life. Friends, we ought to, not, we ought to refuse to move forward without the power of God in our lives. We ought to refuse to rear our children without the power of God and the guidance of God and direction of God in our lives. Follow me as I follow Christ. Let's all stand to our feet, every head bowed, every eye closed. Church, we have a great responsibility upon us. Things that were said tonight, none of it is ever intended to offend you personally. As the pianist plays, but it's intended to challenge you to take the responsibility that God has given us in rearing our children because there's some things worth fighting for. There's some things worth fighting for. Would you agree with me that your children? Your grandchildren, they're worth fighting. Hey, listen, the devil wants them. He sure wants them. Are we going to let him just have them? Are we going to let society have them? Are we going to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Are we going to do our best to teach them and instruct them in the ways of God? Are we going to emphasize the gospel in our home and personal devotions in our home more than we emphasize making sure that we never miss a, a ball game practice or other things. Friend, the proudest day in our life or in our children's life after they were born ought to be the day they were born again. The day that they received Christ as their personal Savior. I'm not saying you don't, you're not proud. I, I, I know you're proud the day they graduate high school. You're proud the day that they maybe get their first job. All those are proud moments. I'm not saying they're not. All I'm saying is that the proudest moment ought to be the day that your child receives the Lord as their personal Savior. Another proud day ought to be when they surrender their life to God. Even if it's to be the best plumber that God has called them to be, even if it's to be the best electrician, best whatever, whatever God has called them to be. But we ought to be even more excited when they say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Whatever it is that you've called me to do. Hey, do you realize that people can surrender their life to the Lord? They don't have to be in full-time Christian service, but they can still surrender their life to the Lord. The safest place to be, church, is in the center of God's will. We ought to pray that for our children. We ought to desire that. Friend, it's not too late for you. So, preacher, I didn't really lead my children in the right way. Well, just like yesterday when I realized I was going the wrong way, I turned around and went the right way. And guess what? My children followed. That was a blessing. Your children are still young, especially if your children, so you still have a great opportunity. You know what? 
Moms and dads, there's been times where I've went to my children and apologized for being short, apologized for not doing something as I should. And if I think real hard about it, there's probably other ways I need to apologize even still now. Friends, I hope that you've been challenged tonight. Let me ask this and we'll pray. Say, Pastor, I really want to take to heart this thing about fighting for our children and raising our children. And maybe I haven't always done the best, but I want to do my best going forward. Would you pray for me? I hold up my hand. Would you pray for me? Pray for me that I raise my children in the right way that's pleasing to the Lord. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you, I see those hands. Praise God. You may put them down. Pastor, pray for me. I'll pray for you. You pray for me as well. Sometimes you hear, well, we'll just wait and see how their kids turn out. Friend, you ought to pray for my kids. I'll pray for your kids. I want your kids to turn out well. You ought to pray for my kids to turn out well. Why would we want some somebody's children to turn out wicked? I just don't see what we would desire that, but we should. If you're here today and never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, would you say, Pastor, pray for me? I'm not sure if I was that day I'm going to heaven when I die. Would you pray for me? Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Listen, if you spend any time around here, God still loves you. God's still saving souls. Anybody at all before we pray? Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we love you. Thank you for tonight. And God, we have a great responsibility, Lord, to protect and to fight for our children, Lord, to teach them your way, to raise them up in your nurture and admonition, to train them up in the way they should go. Lord, there are several other scriptures that we could look at tonight, but Lord, we're just convicted at the thought that they rose up a generation which didn't know you. Father, help that not to be our children. Lord, several lifted their hands. They have a desire to be the right kind of example, show the right kind of spiritual leadership to their kids. Lord, you know who they are. And God, even if we haven't always gone in the right direction, I'm confident that most of us have not. I pray that you'd help us to get back on the right direction, lead our children in the right way. Help us, Lord. Father, I pray if there be one that even though none lifted their hands that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, that you convict them of their need for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for allowing us to be here again tonight. Until the next appointed time, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. God bless you. Glad to have you here in the house of God tonight.